It's a College Sports Friday on Sports Beat KC, presented by Big O Tires, with plenty to discuss with the Kansas City Stars College Beat writers. It's December 6th, and I'm your host, Blair Kirkhoff. Suichi Tirada kicks it off by bringing us up to date on the Missouri football coaching search. We have some candidates' names. When will we have an announcement? Kellis Robinette covers Kansas State, and the Wildcats are playing Wheel of Fortune with their bowl destinations. Where will the Cats land? Kellis gives us the top possibilities. Jesse Newell wraps things up by wrapping up Les Miles' inaugural season at Kansas. The Jayhawks finished with the same record in 2019, 3-9, as they did in 2018, but how different did this season feel? All of this on Sports Beat KC, and here's Suichi Tirada to get things going. Suichi, how you doing? I'm good, Blair. How are you? I'm, I'm better than you are because I, unlike you, am not in the middle of a college football coaching search. I have been in many of them over the years, and it's a, um, it, it's a tense time. But there is some, you know, there was some news that came out late this week about what's going on with the Missouri coaching search. Some names emerged. How about running them down for us? But before you do, let me just say, we're recording this at about 11.30 on Friday morning. It's going to post a couple hours later. So just for a time reference, because coaching searches tend to move quickly, just wanted to let everybody know when we're talking about this. So so what's the latest, Suichi, on, on the search? Yeah, so obviously we reported on Thursday that there were four names that finally came out. And I think that was pretty significant just because Jim Stirk throughout the process, um, especially since he started it last Saturday, that he was going to be very tight-lipped. Um, when I asked him like what he learned from past coaching searches at other athletic directors, stopped, he told me that confident- confidentiality was a big thing. So actually getting names, like actually seeing who's a part of the process was actually a little bit um, – a little bit behind the curtain, especially for a Jim Sterk-led uh, coaching search. So obviously that update, we had it up on Thursday, but sources told the star that there were four names that Jim Sterk kind of informally spoke to some school officials, and those were those those names were Arkansas State's Blake Anderson, um, Louisiana Tech's Skip Holtz, Army's Jeff Monken, and Nevada's Jay Norvell, which realistically, I'm not sure how you think about those names, Blair, but I don't think they have the big name appeal that some Missouri fans are hoping, especially after firing a true son of Barry Odom. And he's been here, Eric Odom was here for four years and everything like that. I agree. I know our, our buddy Vahe Gregorian had a column in today's star uh, that asks, where is the A-list? Because uh, I, I think when, when fans hear these names, uh, they, they ask themselves that. Where, where are the stars? Where, you know, is, this the, is this the idea here that uh, Missouri can't do better than the head coach at, at Army or Louisiana Tech as their next coach? And if, the, you know, if this is the finalist list, uh, could, you, could the question be asked, w- would the Tigers have been better off maintaining the you know the previous regime keeping Barry Odom so I, I've heard some of that as well but let's let's just quickly go down um, the, the 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 four that aren't necessarily finalists these are just these are just names that have emerged that, that as you said Soichi that um, that Jim Sterk has talked to Skip Holtz is the most veteran of of the bunch and just in terms of his coaching experience he's won 147 games at four different schools, he's currently the Louisiana Tech head coach. He's 55 years old, so you know, and his name has been associated with jobs for as long as he has been in coaching. Blake Anderson's been at Arkansas State for what seven, eight years, I believe. He followed um, a, a group of coaches at Arkansas State, like Hugh Freeze and Brian Harsom, who who were just kind of one and dones there. Jeff Monken, of course, at Army. That's a unique situation. He's done an amazing job there. And then Jay Norvell at Nevada. I remember when Jay Norvell was the offensive coordinator at Nebraska, who um, who coached Zach Taylor, uh, helped to a division title. And they played in the Big 12 title game at Arrowhead. And, of course, Zach Taylor is now the head coach of the Cincinnati Bengals. So I just wanted to give you a quick nutshell on uh, on each of those guys. But is it is it your understanding, Suichi, that – um, that that something could happen in in terms of a, an announcement early next week or what what are we thinking there? Yeah, I think Thursday's news of Sturk talking to a few school officials was one a big development just because it was really the first time we've had you know concrete names. And at the same time, I think it threw a little bit of a curveball just because 
it was it felt like it was kind of getting late in the process of the coaching search in terms of finally having a name and the big thing too is that you know Stirk he wanted a name within two weeks so we're wrapping up the first week here so it, it seemed based on his own timeline based on what he wants based on the early signing period for football being starting on December 18th all indications point to there should be an announcement by next week, next week but we just don't know when and I think and I, and I was reading and I was hearing a little bit that this might have been done by the end of this week had it not been for the curveball on Thursday. So it's a little hard to say when it'll wrap up. I think I think Thursday's news did throw a bit of a wrench in those plans, but I would expect Stuart to still have someone sooner rather than later because because Missouri already has three decommitments from recruiting. I mean, Brick Haley, the interim coach, is still out on the recruiting trail and everything, but there's a lot of uncertainty there. So being able to find that guy a lot quicker will uh, will give a lot of stability, especially because there's going to be a lot of short-term attrition between transfer portal, recruiting, and I think people kind of forget that the NCAA sanctions that were upheld, which was last week, crazy to think about, that includes, you know, scholarship limitations, recruiting restrictions, all these kinds of things. So the sooner Sterk finds someone, the sooner they can deal with those problems. So I think we're looking at sometime, hopefully next week for Mizzou fans, just to have that next guy as head coach. For sure. Um, and, and annually, that is the week after the conference championship games is uh, typically a time when you hear a lot of coaching news. It's you know when teams aren't in the postseason play, that's when coaches get fired. So, uh, so you have that little cycle of news, and then another week, a week after that, after conference championship games, another cycle begins. So there, there could be some movement around the country. I mean, Missouri's mm-hmm. not the only job that's open, right? Arkansas, Florida State, Ole Miss, Boston College, among the Power Five openings right now. So mm-hmm. you, these are some of these coaches are, are, who are candidates um, uh, maybe getting their, you know, maybe involved with programs that are playing in conference championship games this week. I'm not identifying anybody in that realm, but but a coordinator at, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a, one of these programs perhaps, you mm-hmm. and, and and they wouldn't, you know, that, that wouldn't that information wouldn't leak out the week of the conference championship game. So what I'm saying is, on uh, starting on Monday, I think you'll you'll st- start seeing a lot of news popping about uh, about coaches and and coaching futures. So, all right, Sweetie, let's um, let's chat a little bit about basketball. A <laughs> oh oh man, what a loss! But frame it for us, will you? What? Um, how, how devastating was the loss earlier this week that Missouri had to Charleston Southern? Yeah, so Missouri lost to Charleston Southern, as you say, on Tuesday, Tuesday night. And I think that was – it was a weird game because Missouri had another one of his slow starts where they were down 12-3 to early. But then they came back. They were up at halftime by a few points. I think it was around 20 to 23 off the top of my head. Um, but the thing is, like, I remember I was sitting and I was watching the game, running up my gamer or whatever, and I was like, okay – Mizzou will still win this. Charleston Southern is, you know, they coming into the game according to Ken Palm, which ranks every, you know, every program in the nation. Charleston Southern was number 313, which really puts into perspective how bad this team was and how bad that loss was for Missouri. I mean, Conzo Martin after the game mentioned on multiple occasions, I mean, that has to be one of the worst losses of his career. And it'll probably go down as his worst loss at Mizzou, depending on how long he stays and how many more games there are. But, yeah, I mean, to put it into context, 313th in the nation is rough. Um, another thing, too, is that the Buccaneers, the, the visitors, they just couldn't miss a three in the second half when it was still tied 56-56. to 56. Didn't know there were around three minutes left in the game. It looked like, hey, Missouri might still pull this out. You know, it wasn't comfortable. But then Charleston Southern hits three straight threes. And then you, and the next thing you know, Missouri is down five, six points with less than 90, 90 seconds remaining in the game. So it was a weird game. Uh, like I mentioned, Charleston Southern couldn't miss in the second half. They shot something like 72% from three. Uh, the, you know, the latter 20 minutes of that game. So, but yeah, I mean, contextually speaking, this that was bad. And I yeah. think... If, if you're hoping for Missouri to go to the NCAA tournament, they have to win this game tomorrow at, at Temple at 6.30 p.m. Saturday. I mean, that's just one of those games where you've already lost. You went 0-2 at the Hollywood Classic. You lost at a ranked savior team. Now you have a Charleston Southern loss. So come March when you're comparing resumes, 
people are going to point to this loss on Tuesday and be like, Missouri isn't a good team. However, obviously, there's still a lot of the season left. We don't know how conference play goes. Dragon Rights is still right around the corner. This game against Temple is big, so still a long way to go. But if I'm a Missouri fan, on top of all this news about football, I would I would not be surprised if you're a little more than discouraged in the, in the state of the athletic department right now. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, it gives Missouri a three game losing streak going into Temple. It dropped their um, their sort of their power ranking, if you will, down into the the high seventies and. So there is opportunity because they play in the SEC to have, you know, if you're a successful SEC team, a top half of the league, you'll, you know, you're probably an NCAA tournament team. But also, if you're a top half of the SEC type of team, you don't lose to Charleston Southern in, in, uh, in December. So that's where it's that's where it stands with uh, uh, Mizzou Suichi. Great talking to you. And when we come back, we will chat with Callis Robinette, who covers Kansas State. He'll give us the latest on the Wildcats' bowl possibilities. When it comes to saving you money on tires, nobody does it better than Big O Tires. Like saving you up to $120 on select sets of Goodyear, Yokohama, Pirelli, and Continental tires now through November 3rd. That's $70 off instantly, plus up to $50 back by mail-in rebate when you purchase using your Big O Tires card. Hurry into Big O Tires and see how much you can save. Big O Tires, the team you trust. For the location nearest you, go to BigOtires.com. Kellis Robinette's here. Hey, Kellis, how you doing? I'm doing good, Blair. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, good talking to you. Um, the Wildcats are in that, that position where they – they know they're going bowling. They just don't know exactly where. You wrote about it this week and laid out the possibilities. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that the the two strongest possibilities for Kansas State right now would be the Alamo Bowl and the Texas Bowl. So a destination in Texas with an outside shot at the at the camping. What is it? The, the Camping World Bowl in Orlando would be. But but I, I don't know. It just seems like a long shot to me. Yeah, um, I. If- as a betting man, I would say I'm thinking they'll probably end up in San Antonio or Houston for one of those games. But you never know as much as things change and bowl directors make decisions on any, you know, any weird reason they could still maybe end up in Orlando. So it'll definitely go down to the wire and be one of the more, I don't know, exciting selection Sundays Kansas State has had in a yeah. while in terms of which place they're going. Right. And it'll go down to the wire because – we, we don't know what might happen with the college football playoff. It, it'll depend on the college football playoff, you know, rankings and the seedings for the, the six bowl games, the New Year's Day and the national games in the national semifinals. And, uh, and this has a direct impact on Kansas State because uh, let's, just, let's just say the favorites win at the top of the, of the college football playoff ranking. That's LSU, Ohio State, and Clemson. And then, you know, and then, then it comes down to Big Twelve. Maybe it may come down to you know Big Twelve champion Oklahoma or Baylor being the fourth team in a dogfight with Utah. If Utah wins the Pac-12 championship, but a possibility of a fourth Big Twelve team getting in the college football playoff, and that would likely put the loser of the Big Twelve championship game in one of the New Year's Day games, which creates positions in the bowl structure. Everybody moves up a spot essentially in the bowl structure. If the Big 12 only gets one team in the six bowl games, everybody moves down a, a notch. So that's kind of the way it lays out for the Big 12. Who are the conferences that would be aligned in, in, in the Alamo? What's, what's the conference opponent for the Alamo Bowl? Right. So if, uh, if both Oklahoma and Baylor go up into the, the major bowls, then, yeah, I think Kansas State's got a decent shot at San Antonio where they would play against a Pac-12 team, and you're probably looking – there at either USC, Oregon, or Utah. So any of those three would be good games. Um, if it were the Camping Rule Bowl, you'd be looking at maybe Notre Dame, Virginia Tech, or Wake Forest. And then the Texas Bowl would be somebody like Texas A&M. It's hard to say exactly who they would choose, but it'd be somebody out of the SEC. I saw Kentucky as a possibility, too, on one of the one of the mock bowls if it, if it drops to the Texas Bowl for, for K-State. The... Um, uh, both Kansas State f- fans are familiar with both destinations, right? They they played in the Alamo Bowl. Was it five years ago? They lost to UCLA, I believe, in the Alamo Bowl. Right. Not right. To, not to be confused with beating UCLA two years ago in the in the Cactus Bowl. And then 
the Texas Bowl. They were there just a couple years ago and beat Texas A&M. I, I think one thing that that seems to be clear is Kansas State doesn't want to go back to Phoenix. They, they've been to Phoenix a couple of times in the last three years. Yeah, they've been to Phoenix, it seems, like more than any other bowl. And they were just there two years ago when they were last in the postseason. So that's not the most desirable spot. I get the sense they don't really want to go to the Liberty Bowl in Memphis either. Um, they were there not too long ago as well. So if, if it was up to Kansas State, they would definitely want uh, Orlando, San Antonio, or Houston. We'll just have to see how it all plays out. And Kansas State put itself in this position by winning its regular season finale over over Iowa State in a uh, windswept game. Uh, it was looked cold and, and very windy in Manhattan, but Kansas State won. I, I was really impressed with with this victory. Um, this was a game Kansas State lost a year ago to not become bowl eligible. The regular season finale up in Ames, uh, Iowa State came back from a big deficit in the in the fourth quarter to beat K-State in, in what turned out to be Bill Snyder's final game on the Wildcat sideline, Kansas State really kind of asserted itself in the in the second half and especially the fourth quarter to end the regular season with an 8-4 and four record. There had to be just some good vibes for Kansas State after this one. Yeah, um, definitely. They were, they were in good spirits. They were really happy to win Farmageddon and close out the season at 8-4. and four. I think that's better than – just about 99 percent of people expected them to do this year um their vegas over under was five and a half i kind of optimistically had them at six and six preseason so for them to come out and end the season with wins over texas tech and iowa state was a a very nice way to springboard themselves into the postseason and i think it meant a lot to them too that they kind of proved they were the tougher team in that game i mean it was just miserable conditions neither team could throw the ball very good it was cold Fans didn't want to be there. There were very few people watching the game in the second half just because it was so, so cold and so windy. Um, So for K-State to come out and impose their will and run the ball for 230 yards against an Iowa State defense that had actually been really good against the run previous to that point all season, I I think was uh, a very uh, morale-boosting victory for them. I don't think that Chris Kleiman will be Big 12 Coach of the Year because – Matt Rule is at Baylor is getting some consideration for National Coach of the Year, but I, I look I, he in any other year he would be a he would be a leading candidate for that. What a, what a what a year for him! And and a lot of times Coach of the Year is based off of where we think a team will finish versus where it ended up. I think that's fair. Right? I don't know really how else to judge it. So in that given that circumstance, um, this was. This was a terrific year, regular season. I know that the, the West Virginia loss was troubling, but they beat Oklahoma. They went to Mississippi State and won. I just, I, I just think this this has to qualify as a as a success. And Kansas State fans, whoever was skeptical about climbing, has to be on board now, don't you think? I think so. I mean, there's no reason to you know overly doubt them at this point. Um, like you said, if they were handing out a trophy for Big 12 runner-up coach of the year, I think he'd definitely win that. Uh, hard to overtake Matt Rule this season, but he, he pushed all the right buttons and you know, got, I think, the most he really could out of this roster. And the crazy thing is about, yeah, they finished 8-4, and four, but it's not like they had a bunch of fluke victories that got them there. You could, obviously, you could honestly say they left some games on the table, like they led 14-0 at Texas. Um, they kind of let down and lost to West Virginia at home when people didn't think they would. If they could go back and have those two games games back, you know, they really weren't that far away from winning 10 games. So that's the kind of progress you want. Last season, um, they were nowhere close to winning 10 games with arguably a better roster. So he came in and, and did a very nice job. And really, if you go back and look through that, throughout the history of first-year coaches in the Big 12, he compares right up there with uh, with the very best of them. Kansas State basketball, oof, Kellis. Yeah, I know they beat, uh, was it Florida A&M this week? Uh, it was Florida A&M, the Rattlers. The Rattlers. Uh, but, but that performance in Fort Myers, especially in the third-place game against Bradley, I was, I was watching that game, and it was just a, um, I don't know how to describe it, but one of the worst efforts I've seen from Kansas State in a while, especially that second half. And, I, I don't know. Look, they they did bounce back and played well. Finally, put a whole game together this week against the Rattlers, but troubling zero and two uh, for the Wildcats in Fort Myers. What were the what were the big issues for K State there? 
Yeah, uh, they they had a few of them. I, the biggest thing that stuck out to me was just um, how different and more difficult it is for Xavier Sneed to score this year. It seems like last season when he was playing alongside Barry Brown and Dean Wade, he was able to get open looks in the corners. Um, his teammates were looking for him on lob dunks. And most of his points were, were pretty easy, um, but there were people getting him the ball, and now that's not happening near as much, and I think that's why um, his numbers uh, maybe aren't as high as some of us thought they were or would be coming into the season. And then you look at the rest of the roster, I think Cartier Jada is a little out of place as the team's primary point guard, even though he is piling up assists. I think he's probably better suited for the two. Um, and then you look inside, uh, you wouldn't think that losing Montavious Murphy, a freshman forward, would hurt him all that much in the front court, but it really has because without him in there, anytime McCall May Ween gets into foul trouble, uh, they're really digging into the bench and putting guys like Levi Stockard in there for long periods of time. And there were uh, a few minutes of action down there in Fort Myers where they were going zero bigs at all and just playing five guards. Uh, and that's that's not what, <laughs> what Bruce Weber wants to be doing. So... It's, uh, you know, I was probably a little bit too bullish on them coming into the season when I said I thought they were a really good bet to make the NCAA tournament. Um, right now, I think they've got a lot of work to do if they want to get back to that point. And they have an opportunity to change perception on Saturday with the most attractive ho- non conference home game of the season when Marquette visits Bramlage Coliseum. Marquette and Marcus Howard, who had this crazy, you know, stretch uh, in, 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 the, in the tournament, in his tournament in Florida, where he he went for 51 and 40 in back-to-back games, then six in the championship <laughs> game uh, right. against in a loss to Maryland. So, uh, look, this, at least Kansas State has this. They they do have an opportunity on Saturday night, eight o'clock tip at Bramlage to um, to make up for maybe a little bit of, of the of the poor play of the of the previous week. Yeah, and you know Bruce Weber's teams have started slow before, even even last season when they won the Big 12, they had some head-scratching losses to Tulsa and to some other teams that you wouldn't have expected. So uh, this is not foreign territory. Bruce Weber's teams tend to, you know, get things figured out around Christmas and then take off in, in Big 12 play. So if you're a K-State fan, that's certainly what you're hoping happens next. Like you said, they got Marquette next. They could win that game. They get, you know, they d- definitely make up a little bit for what happened. And then after that, this month is big for them because they get Mississippi State, St. Louis, Tulsa, and then it's into Big 12 play. So if they can uh, win some of those games, maybe things start to turn around for them. Okay, Kellis, great catching up. And when we return, Jesse Newell will be in to wrap up the KU football season. Hey, it's Blair. Hey, we have a special subscription offer for Sportsbeat KC listeners. Unlimited digital access to the Kansas City Stars award-winning sports coverage. Sign up now for one year of Sports Pass for access to all the sports news, features, and columns we have to offer. And it's only $30. That's a 40% savings off our regular rate. For your convenience, your subscription will automatically renew after the initial term at $50 unless you tell us to cancel. A lot of subscription services won't tell you that. They'll just sneak it on there. We just told you. Your subscription helps support the sports coverage of KansasCity.com and the Kansas City Star. Please visit KansasCity.com slash SportsBeatKC offer to get this special offer. And as always, thanks for listening. Jesse Newell covers the Jayhawks and just completed covering the Kansas football season. Jayhawks finished 3-9 and and 1-8 and in the Big 12 Conference. Earlier this week, Jesse, I asked Vahe Gregorian and Sam Mellinger to give KU football a grade for this season, and both were in the C, C minus to C range. I I agreed with them. Look, I think the over under on KU football this year was three or, or two and a half or three, depending on what uh, what book you were looking at, and um, and and nobody really knew. Nobody knew exactly what to expect from Les Miles in his first year. Um, so did Kansas deliver on? Did they deliver? In, in 2019. I, I think you can look at this a lot of ways, Blair, but I think this grade was a, a lot higher about a month and a half ago. And I think the way that the season ended, it probably dropped it down to that C range. But I also could make a very easy argument to say that 
whether it was four wins or five wins or one win or two wins, that this season is kind of not irrelevant, but it's it's not as important as the big picture of the program when it comes to recruiting and trying to build what they want to build at Kansas. And obviously all these mistakes of the past have kind of snowballed on each other where this has been a whole decade where KU did not win more than three games in any season. So if you're looking at from that an- that aspect, Les Miles' recruiting class right now looks really good. And now it will drop some because they have 24 guys committed at this moment, but as of we speak, as we speak right now, KU's recruiting class from rivals is 30th nationally, behind only Texas and Oklahoma in the Big 12, and that's after, like I just said, a decade long, um, a decade of not having success on the field. So it's very difficult to recruit to a place when you can't point to the scoreboard on the actual field and say, "Hey, this this program has had a lot of success." So if you're ahead of, again, just for the moment at least, Iowa State or K State or Oklahoma State, uh, you're obviously doing something right there. Now, like I said, KU has more commitments than a lot of other schools, so the other, those other schools will catch up here. But if this stays in the top 50 or top 60 recruiting class wise, and Les Miles gets a lot of the done with the high school ranks, guys that can bring into the program and develop, then this might be, you might kind of bump that letter grade up again because, again, this season might not have been about this season. It might have been about the future moving forward. But uh, it's sort of interesting. I, I love the SP Plus stat that Bill Connolly does at ESPN. And um, I, I, you look at those, you know, it goes basically play by play. You can look at, um, it's kind of just a, a big picture view of where you're ranked throughout the season. Okay, you started at 108th in that measure and ended the season at 105th. Out of the 125? Or- so so basically, you can look at that and say, okay, they, they overachieved just a little bit based on preseason expectations. You also could say, look, 108, it doesn't take much to be better than that. But you go to week five, KU got up to 76th. And they were then 84th and 80th and 84th. So that's what I'm talking about with the letter grade. It's like KU showed this progress in the season where they put it on Boston College and they competed at Texas. And they showed these flashes of like, oh my gosh, this might be a quicker turnaround than you think. And then completely backslid late where it's like overwhelmed by Oklahoma State, overwhelmed by K-State, completely demolished by Baylor. So it leaves you sort of wondering about the future of the program. The defense definitely um, was worse late in the season when they got some injuries and the offense was just either great or bad uh, toward the end. So uh, for Kansas, it's, it's kind of a difficult letter grade to give. But like you said, Blair, three wins um, tied for the most that they've had since 2010 in the season. I, I guess that can't be too much of a disappointment, but uh, I think there would have been a lot more optimism had KU ended the season a lot more like they played right in the middle of the season. Or if they had just been able to finish Iowa State when they got the lead in the fourth quarter up there in, 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 the, in the 11th game. I, I would have had, I guess I would have excused the Baylor performance if they had broken the, the, the three win threshold and gotten that fourth one, especially to, to end the long Big 12 road losing streak as well. And they did look good. You know, it, it, in that game, I mean, they played a bowl team tough in that game. Yeah, it's it's weird because I, I just talk about the S and P plus or the SP plus where K you went from 108th to 105th. So like that's not that big of a movement if you go from the beginning of the season to the end. But and and you know I I, I hate. I hate when too much is brought about this, but seriously though, like KU's bad performances were so bad, that's what's dragging this number down because if you look at three games, uh, West Virginia, KU statistically, we talked about this, dominated that game. You know, they had seven yards per play and gave up less than five. I mean, you usually win those games yep. if you do that. Texas, uh, you know, uh, they were up with a minute left and got the two-point conversion and couldn't hold the lead and uh, whatever clock issues we want to talk about did not help their case. There's that as well. And then, yeah, you mentioned Iowa State. You take the lead in the fourth quarter. If you have any semblance of a defensive performance in that fourth quarter and can make one big play, I mean, I'm not saying KU should be a six-win team. That's absolutely not it. But if you look at those three results individually, you should be able to say, well, why can't KU want that one? And that's not even including Coastal Carolina early on, where they lose the game 12-7 with their uh, offense that didn't look anything like the offense late in the season. So for Kansas, you know, it kind of just depends on your view with this thing. I mean, if you look optimistically, could they have gotten to five wins without you changing too much in their history? Absolutely. But at the same point, you know, because the valleys were so low, I mean, because K-State was such a non-competitive game, because Baylor was just a thumping, um, it does make you wonder, like, what what is this team on a weekly basis and uh, how far are they away talent-wise and even scheme-wise from being more competitive in the Big 12 and at least at a level where they could feel comfortable? Well, one thing that occurs to me is, Three wins in a first season of a new regime sets the bar for next year. So now instead of starting at zero wins or, or one or two, 
they're at three with one conference win, and, and you build from there. You know? So I, I think there should be some expectation of an improved record in in in, in 2020, just based on an, enough progress was seen this this season for for KU in in previous regimes when. Um, especially when David Beatty and Charlie Weiss started. I'm not going to include Turner Gill. Uh, we, 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 I think we looked at those those times and uh, and thought, boy, it's going to take two or three years just to maybe get them up and competitive. I, th- I think Kansas is in a position to be competitive sooner under less miles than they were in the previous couple of regimes. Yeah, and I think that here's the difficult part is what they have to replace this offseason, which um, – I think you could make a pretty easy case that Les Miles inherited a lot more than what David Beatty took over. And obviously David Beatty started with the 0-12 season to begin with, and maybe that set the bar lower for him in future seasons, maybe actually helped them out because, like you said, it didn't set a bar a little bit higher. But really, KU has to replace almost all of its offensive line. KU has to replace almost all of its defensive line, and KU's got to go find a quarterback. And uh, if you want to talk about scary starts to a season – Trying to replace an offensive line, trying to replace a defensive line, and trying to replace a quarterback are maybe three of the scariest places, especially when you look at K's offensive line was overwhelmed for most of the season already this year, and the defensive line really didn't create much havoc. KU uh, had one of the lowest turnover or worst turnover margins in the entire nation, and a lot of that was just because the defensive linemen and the linebackers were sort of overwhelmed in there. So um, could be a slight step back next year, to be completely honest with you, and that's maybe just the reality of the situation where KU had a bunch of seniors returning at those two positions, O-line, D-line, and those guys were able to play this year, and obviously you got to go to youth movement next year. But, yeah, we'll see. And if KU can get those guys in that they believe or at least have gotten committed so far into the program, ideally you would want to redshirt them and – get them strong and then play them later on and and you kind of build for the future but if those guys are ready and they're the best options then we might see them uh, early on in their careers at Kansas taking the field so um, that's kind of the challenges facing Kansas as we look uh, toward the future with the Jayhawks in 2020 but as you mentioned the fact that they got to three wins at least showed flashes offensively of what they could do and be a very competitive team that could score in the 30s and 40s uh, that at least should give some hope for the future all right Jesse Newell thanks for hanging out all right thanks Blair That'll do it for another week of Sports Beat KC presented by Big O Tires. Links to the stories we discussed can be found in the show notes and on KansasCity.com. And where you can rate and review our show, please do that. It helps. Thanks to producers Randy Mason and Derek Donovan for putting together today's show. And welcome, Randy. We'll be back on Monday with a discussion of the Chiefs-Patriots game to begin another week of Sports Beat KC, where we talk sports in Kansas City on a daily basis.